Thank you, John. Those were two perfect songs for our subject in this hour. And what I want to do with you in this hour is look at just one verse, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. It's a text that I know is familiar to almost all of you, but you know, sometimes we miss the rich truths in the most familiar texts because we maybe don't look closely enough or think deeply enough about what this text actually says. And this is one of those important texts that is a thousand times deeper than most people will ever realize if you're just reading through the chapter. And so I want to narrow our focus today and look at this one verse very carefully, which doesn't mean I want to skip the context. I don't. In fact, the immediate context here is very important. So I'm going to start reading with another even more familiar text that's just two verses back. But notice it's separated by a chapter division. So I'm going to start reading with 1 John 1, 9. And before I read it, let me suggest to you that there is a central idea that ties these two texts together, and it's the theme of God's righteousness. The apostle is making the point that God is righteous even in the act of forgiveness. Same point Paul makes at the end of Romans 3, uh, that's at the end of that long discourse we heard this morning about human depravity and the universality of sin and the fallen wickedness that has infected the entire human race, and then after relentlessly sort of pressing home that truth of human depravity, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the apostle suddenly switches the tone abruptly in Romans 3 and begins to talk about how repentant sinners can be freely justified as a gift, he says, by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And it's in that context, Paul then goes into great detail to explain how it is that God can freely forgive sins without compromising his own righteousness because Paul says the Father put Christ on display publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith for a demonstration of his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed. In other words, God has for centuries been passing over sins that cannot truly fully be atoned for by the blood of bulls and goats, but now he has provided a true and full atonement for all of those sins by the public sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And this was done, Paul says, for the demonstration of God's immutable righteousness at the present time so that he would be shown to be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Christ paid the price of sin for his people. We've talked about that all day today. Uh, but the point Paul is making here is that God is therefore just and faithful to forgive their sins. Now, if you turn to 1 John chapter 2, look, just look backwards a couple of verses. We'll start with 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, what I want to focus on, and I've always been intrigued by that phrase, we have an advocate with the Father. The old 1984 edition of the NIV translates it like this. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. That is the idea there. Well, it makes Jesus sound like a lawyer, right? That may surprise you. You may have thought there won't be any lawyers in heaven. <laughs> I've no doubt that there will be. I know several skilled and honorable attorneys whom I fully expect to enjoy sweet fellowship with in heaven. And, but the really good news is that none of them will be practicing law in heaven. There's only one practicing attorney in heaven, 
And that's the Lord himself, our advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, it's common in these postmodern times to hear people say that they don't like hearing legal terminology applied to the gospel or the biblical doctrine of salvation. You've, you've heard that criticism, I'm sure. Don't, don't use legal terminology to describe the atonement or God's forgiveness. There's some well-known and influential evangelical teachers who have sort of popularized this idea that we should never use the language of law or the courtroom when we speak of Christ's saving work on our behalf. In fact, I have a, in, the, in my files an article by a well-known Bible teacher who says he thinks that law court language is a Greek imposition that actually corrupts the Hebrew idea of atonement. But notice, the Apostle John in our text is deliberately using courtroom terminology. He's portraying Christ as an advocate, essentially an attorney who pleads our case in God's hall of justice, and it's, it is a surprising picture of our salvation. It's a vivid reminder that the, our redemption from sin is all about divine justice. We're saved by legal means in a way that magnifies the justice of God. So let that sink into your consciousness. I want to stress this because I think a lot of people completely misunderstand salvation. And they think divine forgiveness is something that actually overturns justice or sets it aside as if God's mercy somehow nullified his justice, as if God's love defeated and revoked his hatred of sin. In other words, people tend to think that salvation is grounded only in the love and mercy and goodness of God, as if, you know, he just decided to forego the due penalty of sin and just wipe out the record of our wrongdoings and nullify the claims of justice against us just because his love was so great that it simply overwhelmed his holy hatred of, his, of our sin. And, and so he's saying, I, I just can't do this to sinners, so I'm going to forgive them. That's an erroneous view, and in fact, that is one of the main pillars of the heresy known as Socinianism. The original Socinians were 16th century heretics who denied that God could demand any payment for sin as a prerequisite for forgiveness. They insisted instead that God simply forgives our sin out of the bounty of his kindness alone. And they argued that if God demanded an atonement, if 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 he, if he said yeah, there has to be an expiation or a payment or any kind of reprisal for sin, they said then it isn't really forgiveness when he absolves us. They, so they said, they were saying sin can either be paid for or forgiven, but not both. And so they define forgiveness in a way that contradicts and contravenes divine justice. They were essentially teaching that God could not maintain the demands of his justice and forgive sins at the same time. So one or the other had to go. They thought of forgiveness and justice as two incompatible ideas. Forgiveness, by their definition, meant the nullification of justice. Now, I hope you can see the folly of that view. It essentially argues that God cannot possibly be just and merciful at the same time. It imagines that God's righteousness and the, the notion of peace and goodwill toward men are incompatible concepts. It supposes that God simply cannot be forgiving without relinquishing the demands of justice. But one of the most glorious truths of the gospel is that God saved us in a way that upheld his justice. Psalm 85 verse 10, loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. That's the, that's the benefit of, of, of a true atonement and a true understanding of the gospel. It reconciles righteousness and peace, or mercy and justice. The gospel shows how it came to pass that justice was neither compromised nor set aside in the forgiveness of our sins, but justice was fully satisfied and our salvation is therefore grounded in the justice of God as well as in his mercy. Romans 3.26 again, God is both just, 
and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. See, if you overthrow justice, you obliterate righteousness, and that is what the Apostle Paul meant in, when he said in Romans 1.17 that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. It's also what the Apostle John means to stress right here in this chapter when he says in verse 9 of chapter 1 that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God washes our guilt away, but he doesn't merely set it aside. He doesn't merely obliterate justice and forgive us out of the sheer abundance of his mercy. He forgives us because it is an act of justice to do so. Now, there's a surprising and wonderful paradox in that idea because, you know, we normally think of justice as the attribute of God that demands the punishment of sin. And it is that. Justice cries out for retribution whenever a wrong is done. Proverbs eleven twenty one. 21, assuredly, the evil man will not go unpunished. Exodus 34, 7, God will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And it would be unjust to let evil go unpunished. We understand that instinctively, if we think about it rightly, the truly righteous people always long for God to deal with evil and evildoers. Listen, in fact, to Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple, Second Chronicles 6, 23. He prays, listen from heaven and act and judge your slaves, punishing the wicked by bringing his way on his own head. And then at the end of the Bible, according to Revelation 6, verse 10, you have the souls of those who were martyred for their faith crying out to God with a loud voice, John says, saying, how long, O Master, holy and true, will you not judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And the truth is, God will judge evil. Romans 12, 19, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. That's a promise. And godly people look forward to that day. We may not think about it all the time, but the truth is, if you have godly desires at all in your heart, you look forward to that day when the judge of all the earth will judge the deeds of the wicked and he will purge evil from the universe. He won't compromise his own righteousness by allowing one sin to go unpunished. Jesus said, there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed and nothing hidden that will not be made known. That's Matthew 10, 26. And Luke 12, 3, he says, whatever you've said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you've whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. And his point is that every sin, even the secret ones, are going to be brought out in the open and judged. And justice screams for the retribution of sin because God is a God of perfect justice. He will therefore not let one sin go unpunished. I think we tend to think about these things in a superficial way too much. We take God's mercy for granted, and we ignore His justice, but a right view of God will always exalt His righteous hatred of sin as much as it magnifies His grace and mercy. God's mercy, you know, is not some maudlin sentiment that causes Him to forget about His holiness or set aside His righteous anger against sin. But the demands of God's righteousness must be fully met, fully and completely satisfied if God is ever going to forgive sin. He cannot and he will not simply overlook sin as if it really didn't matter. And yet, he does forgive. And to me, one of the most wonderful things about the gospel is it explains how that is possible. Christ satisfied justice on behalf of all of those whom he saves. He bore the penalty of their sin when he died on the cross. We talked about that this morning. The gospel declares his righteousness so that he would be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In other words, the gospel is not only a message about the love of God. It is that, but it's not only that. The true gospel magnifies God's justice as much as it magnifies His love. But when was the last time you thought of the gospel as a message about divine justice? I mean, real, eternal, 
holy justice for sinners, not talking about the warped idea of social justice that people today are so enthralled with, but real justice. We tend not to think in those terms, and invariably, when you hear the gospel presented today, all of the stress usually is on the love of God, and His righteous abhorrence of sin is rarely mentioned at all. You know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. We love to talk about forgiveness, but rarely is there any attention to the fact that God demanded payment for sin in full, and if that payment had, been, had not been made, there would never have been any forgiveness whatsoever. Hebrews 9.22, without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The truth is that if God's justice had not been fully satisfied, then our salvation wouldn't be possible at all. We'd be damned forever without any hope of mercy. And that's why the Apostle John is using this courtroom terminology. He's highlighting the fact that our salvation is grounded in the justice of God. Chapter 1, verse 9, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin. And then look at our verse, verse 1 of chapter 2. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And again, there's a marvelous paradox in this. We think of justice or righteousness as that, that principle that screams for our punishment. But we learn from the gospel that God has made justice into something that cries out for mercy. That's really a profound thought when you think about it. And in fact, this is the very issue that opened Martin Luther's eyes to the gospel. He was studying Romans 1, and he said he couldn't get past verse 17 because he read where Paul says, the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. And he was unable to go any further. Luther said it made him angry to read that. He said he hated the apostle Paul for writing that verse because he said the gospel is supposed to be good news, but he said it, Paul says it reveals the righteousness of God, and Luther could only think of righteousness as something that demands the punishment of sinners. But finally, he realized what Paul is talking about here is a whole different aspect of divine righteousness. And in fact, Paul was describing this very quality of divine justice that demands the salvation of sinners. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And Luther said it was as if a window to heaven had been opened for him because he finally saw God's righteousness in a completely different light, and he came to love that very attribute of God that he once said he hated. And there's an important point in all of this. Unless you see that the justice of God is as important as His mercy in securing your salvation, you won't love His righteousness the way you should. But if you understand that salvation not only fulfills divine mercy, but it also magnifies divine righteousness, that fact will be a powerful deterrent to sin in your life. In fact, Look at our verse again. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. This is an incentive to to, to withstand the temptation to sin. And this morning, I want to take you into the viewing gallery of heaven's hall of justice so that we can examine the paradox of divine justice up close. And I want to call your attention to three surprising features in this courtroom that are astonishing and wondrous, three features that are not what you might expect in a scenario where the first concern is justice. You have the advocate, that's Christ, you have the verdict, not guilty, and you have the principle that provides for the rehabilitation of the guilty person. And so I want to look at these individually with you, starting with the advocate, our advocate, Christ Himself. This is remarkable for several reasons. First of all, as I said at the start, it's kind of extraordinary to think of Christ in the role of our heavenly advocate, interceding for us with God, arguing in our favor on the basis of divine justice. He's not arguing how great we are or how lovable we are. He's arguing on the principle of divine justice. That is how he pleads our case. That is how he speaks on our behalf. 
He represents us before the throne of divine justice, and he makes the case that justice itself demands our pardon. You couldn't get a better advocate to plead your case. By the way, the Greek word translated advocate there is parakletos, which you should be familiar with a little bit. It literally means one who is called alongside. It has the idea of an intercessor on our behalf. It also can convey the notion of one who consoles us, a comforter. And as you probably know, that is the word that's used of the Holy Spirit in John 14, 6, 14 16, where Jesus promised to send the comforter, the parakletos, someone called alongside us to assist us. And so the Holy Spirit indwells us as our parakletos here on earth. Jesus is interceding for us as our parakletos in the very throne room of God. Now, if you ever get hauled into court to answer any charges, one thing you will discover is that there is no more comforting presence in the courtroom than the attorney who speaks on your behalf. He sits right next to you. He argues your case with more eloquence and authority than you would ever be able to muster on your own. You don't even have to say anything because he takes your side completely and without reservation. He is the friendliest face in the courtroom when he looks at you or speaks to you, and especially when he speaks to the court on your behalf. He's your advocate. Most of all, he is the determined adversary of anyone who has brought charges against you. And that is precisely the role Christ plays for us in heaven. Isn't that an incredible thought? Now, I've been fortunate that in, in my whole life, you might think I get sued a lot because I'm not that likable of a guy, but in my whole life, only once have I ever needed an attorney to plead my case against an adversary who claimed I was wrong and guilty. I was in my 20s at the time, and I did some business with a company in New York that defrauded me and deceived me into signing an unjust contract, a dishonest contract. The whole deal was fraudulent from the start, and the moment I cl complained that the terms of the contract had been misrepresented to me, this company immediately turned it over to their attorneys who sent me a threatening letter that came from this big New York law firm saying that if I made any attempt to get out of their contract, they would sue me and they were going to take away everything I owned, which when I was in my 20s, it wasn't much. <laughs> but it was pretty scary anyway. And, and so I tried to reason with this company for several futile weeks. I wrote several pleading letters and explained that their salesperson had not told me the truth, and, and all my efforts did absolutely nothing to get them off my back. In fact, they stepped up their efforts to intimidate me, and their demands became more urgent and more menacing and, and just threatening and insulting as well, and I exhausted every plea that I could think of on my own, and the net effect was simply to increase the threat that they posed to me. I remember I lay awake at night worrying about what would happen if this big New York law firm actually served me a court summons, and, and I couldn't afford to go to New York and defend myself. And, and so I felt, no, no, really, I was utterly helpless and powerless and defenseless. And so finally I went to see an attorney that someone had recommended to me, and this guy looked at the contract and listened to my story and it took about 15 minutes or less, and he agreed that I had been defrauded, and so he dictated a, a firmly worded letter on my behalf back to this New York law firm. And his letter was shorter, and it was much less polite than any of the letters that I'd already written to this company. But he cited some legal statutes, and he ordered them to cease and desist, and within 24 hours, they contacted me to say they're releasing me from the contract. They wrote me a letter of apology. They refunded almost everything I had ever paid them. In effect, they paid me money to drop the matter. Why? Because that attorney spoke with authority. He knew the law better than I did. He, he dismantled my accuser's charges, and what he did was turn the force of the law against them. And he used all that clout on my behalf. I was the beneficiary of his pleading on my behalf, and I never had to say a word. 
And here's the best part. When the company that was committing the fraud wrote their letter of apology, it was me they addressed the letter to, not my attorney. They apologized to me, not to him. And it was amazing how they suddenly started treating me with respect. Now that I had an advocate who knew the law. And I'll tell you, I like that lawyer. I think, I think he charged me $50 for dictating one letter, which if you add that up for the amount of time he spent on it, he's making a good salary. Dictated it off the top of his head while I was sitting there. Took him less than 10 minutes to do it. But I was never so happy to pay a guy 50 bucks in all my life. If you're ever in a situation like that, you might, you might think twice before you tell any more lawyer, lawyer jokes. That is, if you get the right advocate. And of course, there is no better advocate than Jesus Christ. There is no one who can argue more powerfully or more persuasively, and he never loses a case, never. And notice with whom he pleads. According to this verse, he is our advocate with the Father. He pleads our case before the Heavenly Father. Now, don't get the idea that he is our friendly advocate, but standing before a harsh and unwilling magistrate. It's not like that at all. He's pleading with a loving father, a father who not only loves him, but he loves the person that's being pleaded for. And so in this courtroom, it's not only the advocate who is kindly disposed toward us, but the judge is on our side as well. You know, some people, I think, imagine that Christ is sympathetic to us but the father is stern and unforgiving, and Christ has to plead with him in order to overcome his hostility against us, as if God were opposed to us and, and insisting on retribution, but Christ has to intercede desperately and urgently on our behalf in order to change his father's attitude towards us and overcome the heavenly judge's hostility against our sin. If that's the way you picture Christ's advocacy, you need to get that idea out of your mind because in this heavenly court of justice, the judge is already predisposed to forgive. He is as eager for our acquittal as our advocate who defends us. And in fact, it is he, the father, the judge, who sent the son to become our savior. 1 John 4.10, in, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So the father and his son, our advocate, they both are inclined towards mercy. Psalm 130, verse 7 says, with Yahweh there is loving kindness and with him is abundant redemption. And the psalmist prayed in Psalm 86, verse 5, you, Lord, are good and by nature forgiving and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. And in verse 15, he adds this, you, O Lord, are a, com a God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. And Isaiah 55, 7 says, God will abundantly pardon. Everywhere in Scripture, God is portrayed as eager to forgive, willing to forgive, not delighting in the destruction of the wicked, but pleading with sinners to repent and be reconciled to him. And the obstacle, if you view it from our perspective, is justice. How is it just to forgive? And again, the sacrifice of Christ answers that question satisfactorily. Verse 2, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Chapter 1, verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. It's fair to ask if, if God is willing to forgive, willing to be merciful, and he loves us, and Christ paid the debt that is demanded by justice, why would it be necessary for someone even to plead with the Father on our behalf? Why must the Son be an advocate before the Father? Why do we need a heavenly advocate if God is already sympathetic and so willing to forgive? Well, there's one answer to that. It's because there is someone who accuses us, Satan, who in Revelation 12 verse 10 is called the accuser of the brethren, he is constantly bringing charges against us in the courtroom of God. And in fact, listen to that verse, Revelation 12, 10. 
It's describing the drama in heaven at the end of the age, and the Apostle John writes, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. He who accuses them before God day and night. So you get that Satan, who apparently doesn't need to sleep, is constantly, nonstop, day and night, while you're sleeping, as well as while you're awake, he is arguing the case against you before the judge of the universe. He's pointing out your sin. He's showing what a bad person you are, accusing you, bringing the list of your transgressions before the throne of God, demanding that you be punished for your wrongdoing, and his great aim is the destruction of your soul. But Christ argues your case, and he does it not so that he can change the mind of the judge, because remember, the judge is already willing to be merciful and forgiving towards you if you are in Christ, but Christ pleads your case in order to answer the argument of the accuser, in order to quiet the one who speaks against you, in order to defeat and put to silence the great enemy of your soul. Just as Satan pleads the case nonstop, day and night against you, you also have a tireless advocate who never stops championing your cause. And according to Hebrews 7.25, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for him. For them. That's what he's doing. He's in heaven as our intercessor. We hear that term a lot. Maybe you've never thought of it in these terms, but he is actually answering Satan's charge ag charges against you and pleading your case with his father. And he is constantly doing that in a way that utterly overpowers and overwhelms the adversary and utterly silences his complaints. And here's another remarkable thing about this heavenly advocate. He's the only defense attorney in the history of jurisprudence who will take your case only if you confess your guilt up front. If you try to cover your guilt and refuse to confess that you are utterly worthless and completely worthy of condemnation, you can't have him as your advocate if you refuse to confess. Look back at chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So before he will ever accept you as a client, you must bring your sins to light and confess them freely and fully to him. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You have to confess your guilt to him or he won't have you as a client. So think about this. Every person whom this heavenly advocate speaks for, all of them, each one of them, all guilty, and they've already confessed their guilt before the case ever even comes before the judge, and yet, and this is the most remarkable thing of all, this master attorney, this advocate who pleads your case in the highest court of the universe never fails to win an acquittal. And that's the second surprising feature of this passage I want you to see, the verdict. Here is one lawyer who never loses a case, no matter how guilty and sin-stained his clients are, they never face the judge's condemnation. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8.1. He has turned justice in our favor. And again, it's divine justice. It's not an injustice, but justice when we are acquitted. Verse 9 of, of 1 John 1, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, just, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he's our advocate also, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What he's doing is the righteous thing. And what is the righteous thing? What is the verdict? A full pardon. God who is light and in whom is no darkness at all, 
is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And so the verdict is immediate acquittal and a full and free pardon from all of our sins on the principles of justice alone without compromising divine righteousness in the least. And so in the end, the just is both just the justifier, just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. It's kind of an amazing turn of legal principles on its head, isn't it? And yet it's the righteous thing. Bear in mind why this is possible. It's possible because the advocate himself has already paid the penalty of sin on our behalf. That's what it means in verse 3. He himself is the propitiation for our sins. By the way, don't be intimidated by that word propitiation. We've used it a lot this weekend. It simply means that Christ on our behalf has fully satisfied justice and has also turned away the wrath of God. He's paid the full penalty of sin before our case was ever brought before the throne. So he's propitiated God towards us. He's turned the favor of God in our favor. And in fact, it would be unjust if we were asked to pay the penalty of sin a second time. And so Christ gains our acquittal by pleading that justice has already been served. The penalty is paid in full. He shows his wounded hands and names me as his own. Who wouldn't want an advocate like that? And it's unfortunate that this principle of propitiation doesn't get more emphasis in our thinking about salvation. We talked this morning about the the principle of penal substitution Propitiation is what really sums up that idea, and it's not talked about much. It's rarely mentioned in what passes for preaching in most of the popular evangelical world today. And as I said earlier, there's a lot of stress on the mercy and the loving kindness of God, and that's certainly an important principle. It was God's love that moved him to give his own son as a sacrifice for sin so that forgiveness would be possible. But forgiveness alone would not be possible on the grounds of love alone. God is a righteous judge. He simply can't turn his head and look away from our sin and pretend it never happened. He can't overlook sin and pretend to be righteous by ignoring unrighteousness. Something has to be done about sin. There is a price to be paid. The principle of justice must be satisfied. The wrath of God must be satisfied. If God simply ignored our sin, he would be, in effect, an accessory after the fact. Justice would be fatally compromised without atonement. God's own holiness would be discredited by that. After all, God instantly, you ever thought about this? God instantly condemned the devil and all the angels who sinned by casting them out of heaven forever. And he will one day bind them and cast them into the lake of fire where They will reap the wages of their sin for all eternity, and they never had a chance for salvation. God condemned them the moment they sinned. So how could a God whose standards of justice are that high, how could he exact, how could he excuse the sin of humanity without exacting the price for the sin of Adam and for everyone who's in Adam? How could he do it? Someone had to pay. And it had to be a man who paid, a human being, not a cow or a goat. And not only that, if a man were to pay the penalty on behalf of others, it had to be a man who had no sins of his own to atone for. And for that very reason, Christ became a man, the perfect man, perfect in righteousness, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. That's Hebrews 7, 26. And he paid an infinite price, therefore, suffering the full wrath of God against sin, the full equivalent of eternal torment in hell forever on behalf of multitudes who could never afford to pay that price for themselves. That's the true meaning of the cross. Christ suffered and died under a weight of punishment that is literally inconceivable in human terms. How did he pay that price? Was it by being flogged and spat upon and tortured and beaten by 
wicked, ruthless, merciless executioners? Well, yes, but it wasn't only that. The physical sufferings of the cross were actually an infinitesimal fraction of the pain Christ suffered. The bleeding and the thirst and, and the pain and the bones out of joint and the, the stinging whips, the cruel nails, those thorns in his brow, all of those things may appear to be pain enough. And in fact, those things certainly gave him more earthly pain than any man could ever be reasonably expected to bear. But that alone would not have been enough to atone for sin. And in fact, the physical trauma was only a minuscule token of the real sufferings of Christ because as that earthly drama played out on a Roman cross, there was a far more severe kind of suffering that was afflicting the soul of Christ in the spiritual realm. He received the full weight of divine wrath for all the sins of all his people for all time. God poured out his holy wrath against sin onto the person of his own son. Several centuries before the crucifixion event, the prophet Isaiah was given a glimpse of this and Christ's atoning work. And as he looked at the event prophetically, he saw the crucifixion from heaven's perspective. And this is what Isaiah wrote, Isaiah 53:10. Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. And that same verse speaks of Christ's suffering as giving his soul as a guilt offering. And Isaiah is telling us that it was God who punished Christ on the cross. In Isaiah, Isaiah's words again, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. That's verse 6 of that same prophetic description of the cross in Isaiah 53. Christ bore an infinite amount of punishment. He suffered more of the wrath of God than you or I would ever feel even if you spent the rest of eternity in the torments of hell. And he did it to pay for the sins of everyone who would ever believe. And having already suffered that much, he can now plead our case before God in perfect righteousness. And he's the only one who has the basis to do that because of what he suffered for us. He can be an advocate before the throne of divine justice on behalf of guilty, hopeless sinners, the worst of sinners, and he can gain their full acquittal because justice has been completely satisfied by his perfect sacrifice. That's an important truth to keep in mind as you consider the forgiveness of God. We live in a society where, you know, guilty criminals get off scot-free all the time. In California, that's standard procedure. <laughs> they get off on technicalities. They, they're acquitted by unjust judges and stupid juries and crooked lawyers and really bad district attorneys, devilish district attorneys. And we look at that with resentment, righteously, because it is a horrible miscarriage of justice. But even Satan himself cannot complain of any injustice in the court of God, even though sinners are acquitted all the time, because the price of justice has been satisfied and paid in full already. And so if you're in Christ, you have a perfect advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You can go boldly before the throne of grace and be be absolutely certain that you will find grace to help in time of need. You can live with full confidence that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can be certain that he will hold me fast and rest in the promise that you'll not come into condemnation, but you've already passed from death unto life. If you're not yet in Christ, if you're unsure of your status with him, I want to urge you to flee to him for mercy. You can do that even now where you sit. Confess your sins. Don't try to excuse them or cover them up. Ask the Spirit of God to break your heart over your sins so that you can see it the way God sees it, abhorrent and loathsome and exceeding sinful. If you have God's own inviolable promise that if you confess your sins and he's faithful and just to forgive, Believe that, 
He is both faithful and just to forgive those who come to him through Christ. And now I want to turn your attention to a third remarkable feature of this passage. We've talked about the advocate and the verdict. Here's the third one. It's the rehabilitation of the guilty person, the effect of all of this. Christ's work has gained for us much more than merely an acquittal from our sin. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it turns out that this same principle of perfect justice that gains our pardon also has a kind of built-in remedy for our sinful tendencies because it gives us a motive not to sin. More than that, this remarkable justice doesn't merely gain us a not guilty verdict in the courtroom of God. It doesn't simply wash away the guilt of sin. It does that, but it does more. It purifies us and liberates us from the bondage of sin itself, cleanses us from the stain of our sin. It enables us to overcome the love of sin. It gives us an incentive to keep from sinning. By exalting righteousness, it makes us love righteousness. In fact, look at the opening phrase of our verse. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. He wants to give us a motive to abstain from sin. This is an amazing aspect of John's argument here, and in a way it's unfortunate that when the books of Scripture were divided into verses and chapters, they decided to put a chapter break right there because this statement has to be considered in in the context of what has gone immediately before. Because in chapter three, or sorry, chapter one, three times the apostle reminds us that we are guilty sinners and we must confess this. Verse six, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Verse eight, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And then verse nine contains that familiar, lavish promise of full forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive. Now, there have always been people who think that the principle John sets forth here, the doctrine he teaches us in this text, is hazardous to a holy walk. Even today, there are people who try to explain away or diminish the force of this promise of free forgiveness. We had a group of guys last year at the Shepherds Conference who bought this big panel truck with lights all over it, insisting that you cannot be saved through faith alone. You have to do works to atone for your own sin. Because they think the idea of sola fide, justification by faith alone, they think that's a disincentive to holiness. Now, oddly enough, people who hold that perspective usually fall into some kind of perfectionism, you know, uh, where they teach that it's possible if you exert enough effort and, and exercise enough willpower, you can abstain from sin completely or almost completely, and and attain a kind of perfection. And you see, that turns John's message on its head because anyone who thinks he has attained any degree of perfection is in the very situation John condemns in verse 8 of chapter 1, people who say they have no sin. John's message is clear. We do sin. We all sin. We sin often and we sin miserably, and we are to confess our sinfulness to God. We're to hate our sin as much as he does, but it is possible, and sometimes it happens, that a carnal mind gets a hold of this truth or part of it and thinks, yeah, I can justify an unbroken continuation in sin. After all, if I do sin and God forgives sin, then why not just give it up and sin as much as we can so that grace may abound? And you know, Paul anticipated that very argument in Romans 6, and he says that's an unthinkable position. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And here, the Apostle John is saying the same thing. In fact, He says that these truths should keep us from sin. Far from thinking that the freeness of God's grace would ever lead a redeemed person into sin, he says the principle of free forgiveness is the very doctrine that should keep us from sin. 
If you think free grace means license to sin, you need to examine yourself to see whether you're really in the faith. In fact, the conscience revolts at such an abuse of God's mercy, especially when we realize the unthinkably cruel price Christ has already paid for our sin. Shall we hate him because he is kind to us? Shall we curse him because he blesses us? What kind of monstrous culprit would use the goodness of God as a a reason to dishonor him? Would we crucify Christ afresh and put him to an open shame? No one who truly loves Christ and trusts him in the biblical sense of true faith, no one could ever treat his loving kindness with that kind of wicked contempt and just go blithely on with life and not feel any conviction. The truth is, those of us who do know him, who benefit so immeasurably from his pleading before the throne room of God on our behalf, we don't need any nobler argument for holiness than the richness of his mercy to us. He lives forever to make intercession. He's doing it right now. Pleading our case before the Father's throne at this very moment, and if that does not move your heart with a passionate yearning to serve him and honor him with your life, then your heart is dead and cold, and that's the very sin you need to confess today so that he can forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I hope you'll ponder these things carefully. Contemplate the amazing justice that provides forgiveness and cleansing And let these truths penetrate your soul and set your heart ablaze with a zeal for his righteousness because it's the same righteousness that turns divine justice in your favor and gives you a right standing before God's throne here and now and guarantees you a full eternity of unimaginable blessing. There's no stronger argument for holiness than that. Let's pray. Father, we do confess that we are hopeless sinners. We are powerless to save ourselves. We thank you for sending Christ to be not only the propitiation for our sins, but also our heavenly advocate. Fill our hearts with gratitude and praise, and may we have a true love for your righteousness. May the knowledge that divine justice guarantees our salvation move us to live righteously For the glory of Christ, our advocate, we pray in his name. Amen.